Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ream Library. I'm Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. And one of the great things that we get to do each year, the McFarland Center, along with the Jesuit community, is to bring in Jesuit faculty from colleges and universities around the world who serve as visiting fellows. The program, the International Visiting Jesuit Fellows, is designed to give Jesuits from many different countries the time and resources to pursue scholarship, to collaborate with American scholars, and to enhance our own sense on campus of the global Jesuit community. This year, we're happy to welcome three Jesuit Fellows in residence. Uh, Father Stephen Buckland, who's here, comes to us from Zimbabwe, where he was Provincial Superior and taught and served as Dean of Students at Arupe College Jesuit School of Philosophy and Humanities at Holy Cross. He's teaching a course called God, Gods, and uh, African Religion. Father Luke Bonaventure, ITA Amosu, is not here yet, but will be soon. He originally comes from Benin in the West Africa province and recently earned his PhD in Biblical Studies from the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. He's in residence in the Holy Cross Jesuit community this fall and will serve as a visiting fellow in spring semester. So he'll be a sign up for his courses, students, if you see that coming along. Our third fellow, of course, is Father Heinrich Wachka from Germany, from whom we'll hear today. Father Wachka is professor of philosophy at the St. Gorgon Graduate School of Philosophy and Theology in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, where he served as rector of the faculty. He has been a visiting lecturer at Innsbruck University in Austria, and a visiting scholar at the Western Jesuit School of Theology here in the U.S. He's a member of the German province of the Society of Jesus. He's the author of many scholarly articles and reviews. He published a monograph in 2000, Sagen und Sagen, Saying and Showing, that is, and he co-edited a 2011 volume on Geiststab, the theory of panpsychism. In Holy Cross, he's teaching a philosophy course on selves and their bodies. His lecture, which is also part of the Department of Philosophy Colloquia, is titled Embodied versus Bodily Existence, question mark, Arguments in Favor of, dualistic, of a Dualistic Understanding of Human Persons. Please join me in welcoming Father Vatka. Thank you for the warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to speak to you. In order to uh, approach my subject, I have first to concentrate on personal identity, and then on substance, and then on dualism, and then the question of uh, embodiment versus uh, bodily constitution. First, um, um, personal, um, personal identity. The question, as it is mostly un uh, posed and understood in Contemporary metaphysical de debates is the question of identity over time, diachronic identity, including identity across change. I take it for granted that persons um, persist, that is to say that they exist at more than one point in time and that they can undergo change uh, without passing out of existence. Personal identity matters for several reasons. Uh, in parenthesis, I mean numerical identity, not qualitative identity. Things with qual qualitative identity share properties. They can be more or less uh, qualitatively identical, but numerical identity requires absolute or total qualitative identity and can only hold between a thing and itself. And that's what I mean with identity. Now, back to the argument, identity matters, numerical identity. Why? There are a great many very fundamental practices of great importance to society that depend on the integrity of a notion of personal identity. Which practices um, do I mean? Uh, that me ownership, self-reference, responsibility, accountability, reliability, a faithfulness, faithfulness that means keeping promises that one has given or abiding by an agreement, a contract, a decision, abiding by the law and other moral obligations. If it would not persist, all these practices would be uh, senseless or would collapse. Uh, 
there is additionally um, the, um, the interest persons take in their living on, their own living on, even including uh, the survival of their bodily death. Um, so identity matters. But what matters in identity? And so I come now to the second point, um, substance. Uh, why should we presuppose substances? You may know that the issue of identity became tricky when John Locke, in the famous chapter 27 of book two of his essay concerning human understanding, set apart the identity conditions of substances from the identity conditions of man, that means the human animal, and the identity conditions of persons. Quote, it being one thing to be the same substance, another the same man, and a third the same person. End of quote. What about the animal? Locke sees the animal as an organized body that exists as long as the fluctuating particles of matter, the atoms, are functionally integrated into a whole. So it's then the pers persistence of organization, not the persistence of particles, that constitutes the identity of the animal. Quote, this also shows wherein the identity of the same man consists. That means in nothing but a participation of the same continued life by constantly fleeting particles of matter in succession, vitally united to some organized body. Uh, end of quote. And that's the man, uh, or the human animal. The animal, however, must not be confused with the substance, and the person likewise, in Locke's view. Um, what are candidates for substances uh, in Locke? First, God. Second, uh, immaterial thinking things, for instance, Cartesian egos or souls. Uh, and thirdly, uh, the atoms. Persons are neither substances nor new, uh, human animals. Uh, what defines personhood? A person is a thinker who has reason, reflection, intelligence, and whatever but might be required for transtemporal self-reference. Call this the thinker constraint on persons. The person, quote, can consider itself as itself so the same thinking thing in different times and places, places which it does not by that consciousness, which it, which, is, which it does only by that consciousness, which is inseparable from thinking and as it seems to me essential to it. End of the quote. Call this the consciousness constraint on persons. Locke is presuming that consciousness by its very nature is self-referential or reflective or reflexive better. Quote, it being impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. End of the quote. A person's conscious mental states cannot be stripped off the quality of first personal givenness or mindedness uh, of their content. Call this the reflexivity or mindedness con constraint on persons. Quote, when we see, hear, smell, taste, feel, meditate, or will, uh, will anything we know that we do so. This is always as to our present sensations and percepts, perceptions. And by this everyone is to himself that which he calls a self, end of the quote. That means the self is constituted in the very acts of sensing, perceiving, thinking, and willing. The notions of a person and a self are so intimately related, differing, in that the person refers to a temporally extended ent entity. A person can exist at more points in time, and that the, that the self is a momentary, momentary one, if indeed persons and selves exist. That's the question. Does uh, Locke uh, presume that they really exist? Uh, with this in mind, it becomes clear wherein personal identity consists. In co it consists in the concomitance of consciousness and thinking and willing and acting. Quote, for since consciousness always accompany, accompanies thinking, 
And this is that that makes everyone to be what he calls a self, and thereby, dis therefore, thereby distinguishes himself from all other thinking things. In this alone consists personal identity, that is to say, sameness of rational being, end of the quote. And here comes the point with regard to di diachronic identity, quote, so far as this consciousness can be extended backwards to any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person. It is the same self now as it was then, and it is by the same self with this present one that now reflects on it that that action was done. End of the quote. Okay, personal identity is not grounded in animal identity, that is to say, the sameness of the li living body of the animal, nor in substance identity, but uh, that is to say in sameness of an immaterial thinking thing or a Cartesian soul about whom we have rarely knowledge, remarks Locke, but it is grounded in conscious acts and memory. It is at least um, analytically possible, that is to say logically and conceptually possible, that the same person spreads over more than one animal or brain, or that two persons or even more uh, share the same body. A famous quote from Locke, if Socrates and the present mayor of Quinsborough agree in the same consciousness, they are the, the same person. If the same Socrates waking and sleeping do not partake of the same consciousness, Socrates waking and sleeping is not the same person. And to punish Socrates waking for what Socrates sleeping thought and waking Socrates was never conscious of would be no more right than to punish one twin for what his brother twin did. End of the quote. What should we do with it? Um, Locke's theory marks the decisive break uh, with substance accounts of the self and the shift um, to relational accounts, according uh, to which each self or person is a complex of mental elements that persists as long as uh, the elements are properly related. When Locke made this um, move, he thought of the unifying role of consciousness. And when he talked about consciousness, he mostly meant memory. Locke was still a Cartesian in his uh, conviction that all consciousness uh, is reflex reflexive. Later on, philosophers like David Hume abandoned this commitment to reflexivity and shifted the emphasis from memory and other epistemic notion to causal connectedness between the sensations, uh, which are is in, in a never-ending flow. Um, that allows that the person's identity um, can be extended beyond, beyond the limit of her or his memory, uh, though from a third-person point of view, not from a first-person point, uh, first point of view. The relational character of permanence in time does not appear in the ancient formulation of a substance. It was first Kant uh, in the wake of his shift from transcendental realism to idealism, um, which, um, made, um, which classifies substance together with, with causality among the categories of relation. That is to say, uh, as a condition of conceiving of temporal change happening to something that does not change. Hence, he defines substance as the, quote, permanent in relation to which all time relations of appearance can alone be determined in appearance. That means the real of appearance that the substrate of all variation remains always, always the same. End of the quote. However, one has uh, to keep in mind that Kant's categories do not apply to real things, the thing 
in itself, but to the thing for us, appearances. Uh, very con um, so Kant calls the categories functions of giving unity to various presentations, a unity which is not given in advance to this very act of th synthesis in the human mind. And that's uh, the point of transcendental idealism. Why does the issue of the relational character of, pers of persistence not come up within the ancient notion of substance? The answer is quite simple. Substances uh, were designed to solve the problem of persistence over time in the first place. There is more than one way in which a thing can persist. The Australian philosopher David Lewis has proposed the following distinction with respect to persistence over time, uh, a distinction which became now almost classical or canonical. Quote, something persists if and only if somehow or other it exists at various times. Um, this is the um, neutral word, a word, persistence. Something perdures if and only if it persists by having different, different temporal parts or stages at different times, though no part of it is wholly present at more than one time. That's um, perdurance. Secondly, whereas it endures, endures if and only if it persists by being wholly present at more than one time. End of the quote. A constraint on substances can easily derive from this uh, distinction. A substance is an entity which has no temporal parts, at most uh, spatial parts, if it is material. If it is not material, it might uh, even have no uh, spatial parts. And a thing which persists by being wholly present at any time it exists, uh, if it exists indeed, because it has not existed. In other words, a substance is an enduring thing or a continuant, not a process-like entity that has temporal parts as a fact of matter and which forms a whole by probably relating the temporal parts, parts to each other. Examples for a process-like entities uh, would be a symphony, or a football game, or a war, or a stage play. But I am not such a process-like entity. Heinrich Watzka dreaming of becoming a railroad engineer at the age of 11, or Heinrich Watzka deciding to enter religious life at the age of 25, or Heinrich Watzka passing through a serious identity crisis at the age of 42, uh, are not earlier temporal stages of Heinrich Watzka, but Heinrich Watzka at the age of 11, Heinrich Watzka at the age of 25, Heinrich Watzka at the age of 42. Each time I was wholly present and not simply a temporal part of mine. Needless to say, uh, that a substance account of personal identity can dispen dispense with answering the cumbersome question of psychological continu continuity, what psychological uh, relation might um, our identity through time, time consist, in, consist in. Is it memory or is it more causally, causally connected of mental states? The persistence uh, of the person could be understood as parasitic upon the persistence of any underlying substance or substances out of which persons might be composed if they are composed. But which substance or substances? Before I try to answer this question, I, I should be more explicit uh, on the notion of sub substance, I shall presuppose. In a more intuitive and not yet fully technical sense, a substance is an individual th thing or object 
which contrasts mainly with properties and events. This sense of substancehood is echoed in Aristotle's categories, where he introduces substance, Greek usia, as the primary category of entity. Categories representing the most general kinds or genera into which entities in the world divide. Other categories next to substance uh, being quality, quantity, relation, location, and so on. You may know that. The individual substances are the subjects of properties in the various other categories, and they can gain and lose such properties whilst themselves uh, enduring. There's an important dif a distinction pointed out by Aristotle between individual substances and kinds. Thus, for some pr purposes, um, he discusses um, substance as individuals, and for other purposes, it is a discussion about uh, universal concepts that designate specific kinds of such individuals. That means if, uh, um, there is no substantial individual which is not uh, an example of a substantial kind. And in this theory, I, I will buy in, so it's, so it's totally Aristotelian. In the categories, um, this distinction um, between individual and kind is um, marked by the terms primary substance and secondary substance. For instance, tiger, the cat, is the primary substance, the individual, and cat or cathood, the universal, is the secondary substance or the kind. Mm. If one is concerned with, uh, concerned with kinds of substance, one can ask questions like, what constitutes something as an entity of that kind? For instance, what constitutes a uh, cathood, uh, humanhood, personhood? Or what is involved in being a human, a cat or so? That's the question of the, uh, uh, the essence of substantial kinds. But if one is concerned with individuals, uh, a parallel question would be what makes that particular individual of a given kind, um, the being um, that it is over time. This is the question of individual essence and of identity over time, and that's the, questions, that, that's the question we are um, interested in. Aristotle was more uh, interested in the first question, and the modern debates are more on the second question. But you may know that uh, that's not all what can be uh, uh, said about uh, substances in Aristotle. Uh, later in Metaphysics, book, book 7 to 9, he probes a different approach to substance. Um, substance is now analyzed in terms of form and matter. The substantial form is what kind of thing the object is, and the matter is uh, what it is made of. Um, you may know that a matter um, is not simply the stuff which is there, but that matter is a functional um, term. Matter is always uh, 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 relative to uh, uh, a um, specific kind or individual. For instance, um, the matter for humans is flesh, bone, and blood. Uh, the matter for flesh, bone, and bones and blood uh, are the elements and uh, the matter uh, of the elements is this so-called primordial matter. What, what might that be? That's um, the burden of hylomorphism. That's uh, uh, the label for this um, theory uh, to, de to determine what is uh, primordial ordial matter and what is form that doesn't fit in very well in a scientific worldview. The substantial form represents the formal cause of an object's coming into being, the account of what it is like to what it is be to what it is to be a cat or a human or a person, and the matter is what uh, I just uh, uh, described. Aristotle is somehow undecided on what calling a substance in the first place, the matter alone, or the form, or the compound of matter and form. 
In any case, um, the individual is always the compound of substantial, substantial form and matter. And this doctrine became, as I already mentioned, known under the label of highly morphism, highly being the Greek expression for matter, morphy for form. And now in an audacious move, Aristotle equated the soul in a living being, an animal or plant, with form and its body with matter. Therefore, the animal or plant is by its very nature a compound of soul and body being inseparable from each other. That's more or less the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Uh, I think so. Hylomorphism. <laughs> Um, Aristotle's account fits in very well with animals, however, but not with persons. Uh, that's a difficulty which was always uh, recognized. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas found a compromise. Uh, let us suppose for the sake of the argument that the human person were the human animal. As an animal, the person is a compound of matter and substantial form. Uh, the form is substantial since it actualizes matter and gives it its very essence and identity. However, the human person is defined as an individual substance of a ra rational nature. That's the famous definition going back to Boetius in De Persona et Duabus Naturis. naturis. Hence, uh, the substantial form of the human person is the ra rational nature of person. The exercise of rationality, however, is an operation uh, that is rather immaterial than material, as one would presume, unless one would, would make uh, the claim uh, that matter by, it, matter by itself has the capacit capacity to think. Materialists nowadays uh, think that it is so. Aristotle is... Uh, totally clear on this issue, the exercise of ratio or of nous, uh, the Greek word for intellect, forms no part of the exercise of soul or psyche, which can be explained in material terms as nutrition, reproduction, heredity, some kinds of monitoring, motor control, reaction is concerned. Operations we would identify as, as thinking cannot explain in material terms. Uh, from, this is from this it follows that the intellect or person, at least the rational part of the person, is not essentially, mat essentially material. Does it follow that it is immaterial? Yes, that's exactly what um, Aristotle uh, thought it was. As being immaterial, the intellect does not depend for, ex for it, its existence on being united to matter. The intellect is capable of existing by means of its rational, rational nature alone. Now, uh, what has happened? The person uh, and um, the animal comes apart. But that's exactly what Aristotle thought. The intellect is one, divine, and co-present co within the soul of the human animal, however separable from, from it, and in no sense individual or personal. The animal soul was conceived as mortal, the intellect as immortal. Alas, the intellect was not the, uh, the person. St. Thomas Aquinas had enormous difficulties to reconcile this view with the teachings of the church, who was eager to proclaim personal resurrection of the dead, sort of a bodily resurrection, and not simply um, the, um, the living on of souls. And even if, if that was granted, uh, uh, this soul would not uh, be an individual. It would be um, simply the intellect. It wouldn't have uh, uh, any uh, individuality. Uh, you may know that Descartes offered a somehow different uh, account of substance, leaving hylomorphism aside, and that what I want to do also. He defines substance as an entity which is capable of existing, existing by itself, whose existence 
is not dependent on the existence of any other thing. Strictly speaking, as substances can only be God, is the only substance, because he, he, he needs anything, nothing, in order to exist. All other entities uh, other than God are depend dependent on God for their very existence. So God and all created things are infinitely different from each other, yet we consider the creator and what is created alike as entities or beings. Thus, we can also name uh, um, created things substances uh, with a certain justification. Um, and there are exactly two um, kinds of substances, material body, uh, which is defined by extension, and uh, mental substance, which is defined by thought, which in this context is more or less equivalent to consciousness, uh, including uh, thoughts, memories, feelings, percepts, perceptions, and sensations. Um, substances are accessible through their attributes, and each uh, distinct, distinct kind of substance has an eminent property in terms of which the essence of this substance can be determined. With respect to mental substance, the attribute is thought. With respect to material substances, the relevant attribute, attribute is extension in space, not in time. What is most important, individual substances have these attributes exclusively. Either it is a mental or Corporeal, corporeal, but not both. And that's a very um, heavy burden for Descartes. So he has uh, um, to postulate uh, two different uh, substances uh, in the human um, being. One the body, one the soul. Um, nevertheless, and that's very interesting, um, in Descartes, and that's uh, somehow a pathway to my solution, uh, which I want to uh, uh, offer. Descartes um, understands the soul's relationship to the body, uh, not instrumental. He clothes his critique in the metaphor of the pilot and the vessel, a metaphor which he attributes to Plato, but it cannot be found liter literal literally in Plato. There's only the soul in a nutshell, uh, or so, in the nutshell, the body. Here a quotation uh, from the sixth meditation on first philosophy. Quote, now there is nothing I am more emphatically th um, taught by nature of mine that I haven't ba have a body with which there's something wrong when I feel pain, which need food and drink, when I experience hunger or thirst, and so on. Nature likewise, likewise teaches me, though these very feelings of pain, hunger, hunger, thirst, and so forth, that I'm not present in my body as a pilot present in a ship, but that I'm very closely conjoined to it and, so to speak, fused with it, so as to form a single entity with it. End of the point. That's remarkable from the point of view of a dualist, uh, um, uh, it hints uh, towards a more um, somatic or integrated approach to the understanding of human persons. Descartes uh, argues for this, um, for this uh, intriguing or intimate uh, union or entity of um, un unification or fusion as follows, quote, for otherwise, when the body is endured, I, who is nothing but a thinking thing, would not feel pain as a result, but would perceive um, the puri intellectually as the pilot perceives by sight any damage occurring to his ship. And when the body lacks food or drink, I would understand this explicitly instead of having confused feelings of hunger and thirst for, for, for th certainly these feelings are nothing other than confused modes of thinking arising from the union and, so to speak, fusion of the mind and the body. End of the quote. 
The argument goes as follows. Self-concern um, for, our, for our body ex is expressed phenomenologically by a kind of identification we make with the content of our sensations. We identify us with the content of our sensations. Therefore, therefore when we are aware that our bodies are stimulated or affected by inner or outer cause, we feel something that has happened to us rather than to the, than to the body. Uh, we don't think that our body has been injured, but we feel it directly. So there has to be this uh, union or f fusion. However, uh, this fusion uh, doesn't go so deep and, uh, and isn't so real that it would be justified to speak of one substance. Uh, there remains two substances. In the wake of the revival of ontology within analytic, analytic philosophy during the last 30 years, um, we have seen a remarkable comeback of mind-body dualism, although it is always a position of a minority. This um, dualism uh, doesn't come always uh, in the guise of substance dualism. Uh, most arguments uh, uh, in favor of dualism, rely heavily on modality, that is to say, on intuitions with respect to possible worlds. Um, one can broadly distinguish uh, t uh, t um, two uh, forms of arguments, one um, from the possibility of disembodiment, and second uh, from the dis um, um, possibility of disensoulment. Both uh, argument, types of arguments exploit the difference between analytic and nomological possibility. Arguments of the first type uh, try to highlight the possibility of disembodied existence, and they are mostly uh, Cartesian in style because they simply um, take arguments uh, which are already found in the second meditation of Descartes and apply it to the modern um, discourse of, uh, possible, of possible worlds, logical possible worlds, uh, nomologically possible worlds, and say um, that it is um, concept conceptually or logically possible that I exist, uh, whereas uh, nothing physical exists. Uh, uh, that's not a nomological uh, possibility, uh, they would say, uh, but uh, logical, and that um, suffices um, to say um, that the person uh, and the body uh, are nevertheless distinct entities uh, uh, because of this asymmetry uh, be uh, between these uh, possibilities. Um, and the other argument, uh, the argument from disensoulment, uh, I think, um, is more prominent. Um, there, the hero is uh, David Chalmers. Uh, uh, who, um, who highlighted the possibility of zombies. A, a zombie, in the sense of Chalmers, is a doppelganger, a double of mine, which is an exact physical duplicate of mine. Whereas my inner states, thoughts, feelings, memories are conscious, uh, the thoughts, feelings, and memories of my doppelganger are not conscious. My doppelganger possesses uh, the functional equivalents of mental states. That is to say, he exhibits some mentality, but mentality uh, which is completely deprived of um, consciousness uh, and the whole richness of, uh, of phenomenali phenomenality. But nevertheless, he functions as I function, says um, um, Chalmers. Um, you see, uh, he sets apart a mentality and consciousness, uh, which I think is a very bad move. Uh, there could be mentality without consciousness, and the phenomenon is consciousness, not mental, uh, mentality, uh, which cannot be explained in physical terms. That means uh, um, that uh, conscious states do not supervene on physical states. Uh, mental states do. Uh, okay. Uh, that's a very sparse version of dualism. Um, and that's not substance dualism, but uh, property dualism. 
Okay, um, how now um, um, can I lead you to, uh, the, to the acceptance of, um, of um, the substance dualism? Um, many philosophers in these days uh, are happy to agree uh, that mental uh, properties cannot be fully reduced to physical properties. Uh, uh, most su such philosophers would deny that these properties are um, um, f uh, um, purely f physical. They would say uh, these mental properties are properties of a, of a material substance, say an organism or a part of the organism, a brain, so that there's no need in postulating uh, non-material uh, substances as the bearer or subject, subject of these properties. Uh, that means um, the material system or the uh, organism or the brain uh, can um, exhibit the role of a substance of these, uh, of, a, of, of a subject of these uh, um, mental states. Um, so um, many say then um, that uh, the persistence conditions of the persons uh, are uh, no other than the persistence conditions uh, of this organism or the most important part of this organism, the brain. Which, which is responsible for consciousness, uh, reflective thought, and so on. There are um, actually um, two main views uh, which are um, heavily debated. Um, the first view is that the person is no other than the human animal, uh, that uh, people are animals. This um, view is discussed under the label of an animalism, though it, uh, it has roots in the thinking of Aristotle. It came up um, only recently. Um, main exponents are Eric Olson, P.F. Snowden, David Wiggins, a little bit older. The claim that all human persons are animals uh, should not be taken to assert that all persons are animals. Animals, there might be persons um, who are not animals, uh, for instance, angels or robots or data processors or even God, if you like. But um, um, we, uh, as human persons, are animals. Um, the ter term person, say the anim animalists, uh, does not express a sort of concept but it is a so-called phase uh, sortal. Uh, what's the proper role of sortal concepts? Uh, they help to single out substantial kinds uh, and to determine the persistence conditions of their instantiations, that means uh, the individual. So example for sortals would be a cat or human, or a tree. So, but there are also phase sortals, um, which single out a temporary stage of something. Uh, um, ex um, examples would be infant, or toddler, or teenager, or adult, or old man. These are phase sortals. Um, Simply by reaching a particul particular age, for in instance, something that was not a teenager become, can become a teenager without ceasing to exist. And likewise, we can say um, something that is now a teenager can cease to be uh, uh, one um, without ceasing to exist. Um, and so likewise, say the anim uh, animalists uh, with person. Personhood is a phase that begins when uh, the, the organism exhibits the capacities, Locke and Descartes and other identified with personhood. And it concludes uh, uh, when the animal loses these capacities. Uh, therefore, uh, the proposition uh, persons are animals uh, expresses identity, uh, not a zoological taxonomy. Um, that's very important. Uh, because there are, we exist even when we are no uh, persons, uh, because we 
began as no persons and we will probably end as uh, no persons. Um, so persons form no substantial kind. But I think personhood is a substantial kind. Okay. Um, animalism is under fire from the side of so-called neo-Lockean approaches to personal identity. Main protagonists are Harold Noonan and Sidney Shoemaker. Um, the neo-Lockeans are Lockean because they follow Locke in that some psychological relation is necessary or sufficient for personhood. But uh, in contrast to Locke, they underline the, the importance of the brain, that is the organ who brings up uh, consciousness and memory and other uh, mental um, states. Um, the claim is not that persons are just brains, but uh, that uh, the person is constituted, uh, con constituted by proper brain function functioning. If my cerebrum were transplanted into another person's body, uh, the skull has to be emptied. After, uh, then the recipient would be psychologically continuous with me, though that would be, would be me. If one of my cerebral hemispheres were destroyed, uh, the resulting being would still be uh, psycholo psychologically continuous with me, it would be the other half. If we did both at once destroy one hemisphere and transplant it, transplant the other, I would go where the other half of my cerebrum went. The problem with this approach is that it multiplies entities beyond necessity, according to the neo -Lockian. I am not the human animal, but something else. So uh, it follows paradoxically uh, that there is the animal, which is a conscious, intelligent being other than me, and there's me. Um, assuming that I'm a materialist. If I w would be not a materialist, I wouldn't say that, but if I'm a materialist, that's evident. Where the animal is with brain, there is a person. And uh, when the uh, neo Lockean says um, the person is not the animal, so there exist at least two, uh, the animal uh, and the person, as the neo uh, defines it. For instance, um, I believe that I'm the person and not the animal because I accept some Lock Lockean approach. Uh, and the reverse side is also possible. The animal thinks that it is the person and not I, because it favors animalism. Uh, so one wonders who is right. That uh, could be a hint that materialism isn't a coherent uh, uh, position as it comes to person, personal identity. Uh, some materialists uh, favor a constitution over identity because they shy away uh, from the straightforward identification of the person with the human animal. Therefore, the, they introduce a specific relation, material constitution. The analogy, w analogy would be the relationship between the statue and the marble, although the statue is not identical, identical to the marble, it is constituted by it, that is to say, the statue shares all the properties of the piece of marble, even the same location in space. However, the marble possesses some of these properties derivatively. The statue possesses them non-derivatively, for instance, its shape. Likewise with the person and the animal. The animal possesses some of the properties derivatively, the first person in perspective, for instance, um, whereas the person possesses it, it non-derivatively and so on. The chief proponent of constitutionalism is Lynn Rudder Baker, professor at Amherst. But why should one accept um, the unspoken premise which all partisans of the debate share, namely that living bodies or their parts can exercise the role of subjects of experience, of rational thought and agency? Why assuming that cells are constituted 
constitutively bodily, either identical with an organic, organic body or, or constituted by it. Is there an argument that blocks the straightforward identification of the animal with the person? Uh, I found one argument in um, Jonathan Lowe, to um, my mind the most intelligent defender of substance dualism in contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, he argues uh, uh, with, uh, with the concept of reference uh, and self-reference -refer uh, uh, by means uh, of the first person pronoun I and he distinguishes uh, between a direct and indirect uh, reference uh, and he underlines um, that um, uh, the reference, uh, the self-reference uh, um, is um, direct, not indirect. What does it mean? Uh, indirect um, reference means that it depends for its success on one or more independent acts of reference, for instance, using a proper name, a definite description, uh, or the, one uses sortal predicates or other means of tracking objects in the uh, objective word, whereas direct dem demonstra demonstrative reference means a reference which is not indirect, um, which can be successful without using any of these devices, uh, naming, uh, referring it under a description, or tracking it somehow in space and time. And that, that's what we do um, with respect to ourselves always. Uh, uh, we refer to ourselves um, um, directly, not indirectly. These acts of reference by means of the first person pronoun are, now quote of um, Sidney Shoemaker, they are immune to error through misidentification with respect to the person who uses this pronoun. That means I can never go wrong in that's me who I am referring to. This can't be said uh, of the use of all other indexicals like here and now and there and this. Uh, it always needs for its, for its successful um, reference uh, uh, a complement of other means of reference. What then does it mean to say that a uh, certain pain is mine? The answer would be, um, it depends on how we see the reverence of the first person pronoun I. On a neo-Lockian construction of a self, one would have to say that the reference of I has to be fixed through various acts of its use. For instance, when I remember that I ate ice cream yesterday, uh, or that I remember that I entered religious life on September 15th, or that I remember that I visited New York in 2001, a few days before 9-11, the self constitutes itself in this Lockean um, conception through these very acts of recognition or recollection. Or in a more scientific vein, you may say that the brain is making the connections which are relevant to my identity. I want to insist, how could a, a, rec a recollection ever become mine uh, if it were not already identified as mine, as mine by the character of its first personal givenness? Lowell puts it as follows. A quotation, the self must be conceive, conceived as having the status of a substance vis-a-vis -vis its thoughts and experiences. They are ad adjectival upon it rather than being related with them as a set is to its members, end of the quotes. Thoughts and experiences depend for their identity upon the identity of the subject possessing them rather than reverse. Um, so you cannot constitute selfhood simply by um, Com uh, combining or collecting uh, 
um, memories or sensations uh, because uh, they don't exist uh, without a subject, a, a subject. Or can they be just experiences without an experiencer or a sense of mindness without an ego or self or first personal givenness without an I or subjectivity without a subject? I would say no. But even that is debated, you can imagine. I, I would say we have to postulate the existence of a substance uh, or a substantial self as the substance, subject of this experience. The, the materialist at this point of the argument can agree. Assuming that we need a substance, why not say uh, that the substance is the living body, the human animal, or if you prefer constitute, constitution, uh, constitutionalism, uh, the substance you need is constituted by the animal, by the animal or one of its parts, the brain. Why is this, this not true? First, um, what makes one individual thought or experience different from another is not determined by the body or the brain state with which it is related or even for which it is realized, uh, upon which it supervenes, if you like. Because who can rule out a priori the possibility that one and the same thought is related to two different bodies or brains. Maybe not nomologically, but logically, who can uh, rule it out? What if the supervenience basis for experiences and thoughts is spread over many animals or brains? It's a possibility. But even let us assume for the sake of the argument that they are um, related exclusively to my, uh, uh, I must not say my, uh, uh, to a body which is here, because there isn't yet constituted a my or a self uh, um, or a brain uh, here. But I think this would not help. Uh, the body or brain cannot exercises, exercise the role of a self in order to do so. There would have to be selves. But aren't there selves? Let us grant for the sake of the, argu of the argument that, a, that even the body knows in some uh, sense uh, something, uh, that he has representations of something, that he has contentful inner states, um, which causes a token experience of mine. So uh, um, my experiences uh, uh, are really related to this body, causally. Um, but it could not be guaranteed to know that uh, from the perspective of the body, that itself was the unique subject or owner of this token experience. Um, and why is the body excluded from this sort of self-knowledge that is specific to a self? The right answer would be that the body is not endowed with a first-person perspective, or is it? I would say no material system, however complex, can refer directly to one of its inner states, or to the system as a whole, but only when it went through an identification process. Maybe there might be such identification processes. But even then, without a self, uh, there is nothing to identi identify with. There are only um, um, physical stage, states which are related uh, somehow to each other and um, um, which are uh, combined uh, to play a functional role, but at no, no point of the process um, there can be a, an act of identification with uh, something. Uh, no material system can ex exhibit by itself the characteristics we ascribe to real selves. So I say we have to uh, postulate real selves and uh, they are uh, they are mental substances. But now I have to end. I have um, really, uh, I would, uh, no, it, the time is over. I spoke already one hour, uh, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, we can, could continue it in a, in a, in a in, um, or I could explain it uh, what or how uh, um, Lowe um, conceives of the self. Um, it is uh, very similar to this Descartes. Um, 
but and now I will end. And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much.